Hey, so quick transition to sitting down. Um, we are we we do a panel every probably every semester at least, um, sometimes more than more than once a semester. Um, but what it gives us the opportunity to do is answer the questions that you you've given us. Um, we want to make sure that as a team we are able to uh, talk about the things that are really relevant in your lives, um, and we do a really I think a good job of of, of setting up series that do that. Um, we're really intentional in praying and talking with you and talking with your leaders to see what are the things that you find important, the things that you find interesting and applicable to your lives. Um, but tonight, um, we we get to really address some of your direct questions. Uh, some of them were really great. Um, some of them were a little bit off the wall. Um, but we're going to try to answer them nonetheless. Um, so um, throughout our, our evening here, um, you'll see on the screen that there is a, there's a slide with a QR code. And what that is going to allow you to do is, if we have time, uh, we're, we're going to answer some of, some of your questions um, that you submit tonight. Because what we know is that discussion, an active discussion, sometimes yields questions, and you might be wondering, like, something, or you might have a follow-up question to something we answer, and we want to try to answer that. We might not get to answer that tonight, um, but we will figure out a way to get that answer to you um, at another time, if it's not tonight. Um, but throughout the evening, you'll, you'll have that QR code available. Uh, but first, before we get into our questions, um, we're going to introduce our, our lovely panelists. Um, and uh, so what they're going to do is they're going to tell us who they are, so your name, your name, and then uh, we're gonna, you're going to say like what you what you what you ser- how you serve here at New Life Students, and then you're going to tell us your favorite dessert. You can start wherever here or there or there whatever wh- whoever wants to start. John can start. My name is John Cadmore. I am the eighth grade boys leader. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you can clap for that. Thanks. Uh, and <laughs> good. That's- uh, my favorite dessert is probably my wife's chocolate chip cookies. Ooh. Ooh. I miss it. I've never had them, but they sound good. Yeah. <laughs> she should make us some. <laughs> Andrea's like, oh. How do we get said cookies? <laughs> uh, my name is Kristen Widener, and I'm the family pastor here at New Life. And um, on, at, for New Life students, I am on the content creation team, and I get to lead the presentation team. And my favorite dessert is pineapple upside down cake or cheesecake from Cheesecake Factory. Anything with pineapple. Pineapple desserts. Yeah. It's a large, large field I know. There. I, I, there's actually too many desserts to really just pick one. So it's, that's a really I, hard I question. Many things. Chocolate chip cookies are great. Cake's great. Not the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're all good. I'm Leslie Liker, and I'm the admin for New Life Students. So I process checks and type things into a computer. Um, I also she bought all of more. your donuts tonight. Yeah! Go, Leslie! <laughs> and let's go with donuts, because you can have them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. But that's, a, that's a strong... That is good. That's really good. Thank you. Wow. Hmm. Very versatile, those donuts are. Um, while we're on the topic of food, we'll kick it off with a... With a John, a question for you. Um, this is a question that you guys submitted, and I think it's a fair one. Um, do you get hungry in heaven? So, Revelation 7 says that we will never again, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. Uh, and it goes on to say that they are with the Lamb. It's on the center of the throne. Okay. So then in Revelation 22, a little bit later, it describes the river of water of life and the tree of life that bears 12 crops of fruit every month. Um, Jesus also said that his disciples would eat with him at his table in the kingdom. Um, So it seems like we will have food in heaven and drink and that we probably will not hunger, not because... We don't have to eat where there won't be food there, but because there's so much abundance that there's no reason for hunger. Um, the, the tree of life that bears 12 crops means that 
there's food all the time. Apple trees only produce fruit at one time of the year. So if there's fruit on this tree at all times, it's an indication that there's always food, there's always water, always drinks, whatever. Um, and it probably won't be for sustenance. It won't be a biological thing that we need to eat, but more like a feast because food is good and eating is good and it makes people happy. So. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, food is good. And uh, yep, um, the Bible talks a lot about us in community and it, it usually adds in there that they were, they, they were breaking bread together, um, especially in the early church. The early church was meeting together in community. Nobody was without uh, anything that they needed and they were breaking bread together. And I think that that is probably a really good picture of what heaven's gonna look like. Yeah, that's, and uh, I sure do hope that there's all kinds of desserts up there. Um, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, and while we're, while we're at it, uh, remind you guys, if you guys have something to add, jump right in. You have mics. You all have your own mic. Um, which, that's a privilege. So use it. Um, so uh, Kristen, we're going to go in a little, a little bit, not talking about food in heaven, but we are going to talk uh, a little bit and answer this. Why are there so many standards to be a Christian? So this is a really good question, and whenever I saw it, I was like, I'm so happy that whoever asked this question, asked this question, because I know that it can feel like this really long list of do's and don'ts, and they might seem really overwhelming and unfair at times. But here is the deal. These standards are not just random rules that we should follow, but they're actually part of this bigger picture that helps us live our best and most fulfilling life for Jesus. See, they reflect who we're becoming, so we can align who we want to be with who God wants us to become. They also help us to stay connected with one another. So I want you guys to think about, like, being on a team or a club. There are certain expectations. There's a mission that you're all working towards together to accomplish, and the same goes for being part of the Christian community. See, these standards help us stay connected to one another. It helps us know how to live. It helps us to live more like Jesus so that we can go and serve others and reach the lost. Now, this one might sound really strange, but these standards actually bring us freedom. They actually bring us freedom. See, I always like to think of it like when you're driving a car and you have the guardrails on the side of the road, those guardrails are there to help keep you safe, to help you not veer off to the side of the road and get in an accident. And that's what the standards are there for. They're, help to, they're there to help us stay on track, to keep us in line, to keep us from getting into trouble, but also they're a guide to help us to live more like Jesus. Ultimately, it's not about the rules. It's not about following some certain standard, but it is about having a relationship with God. See, these standards are put in place to help us understand what it really means to live in a loving, authentic relationship with the Son of the living God. So when you think about these standards, I want you to think of them as being put in place to help you thrive. They are not about limiting you. They're about guiding you to a life that's really rich, that's rewarding, and you will have a fulfilling life in Jesus. Yeah, uh, we talk a lot about being obedient, remaining obedient, um, and obedience isn't really so much as following rules as much as it's um, listening to the one who has authority over us and uh, doing what we, what we are commanded to do out of love and out of a desire uh, to go back into our full relationship with him. Yeah, speaking of obedience, Leslie, um, one of the questions we had, and I think this fits right into it, like how do we know when we're supposed to get baptized? You should do it. Right there. Um, I think really what the question is, is how do I know that God wants me to do something, right? And in this case, it's that I should get baptized. Um, and the first thing that we would do is look to scripture, right? If I want to do something and I'm wondering if this is um, what God has for me, then I would go to scripture. And scripture is very clear that as believers that we are to be baptized. It's a, an outward expression of our inward faith 
Um, it's done in a public setting, whether it's here on a Tuesday night or on a weekend or at the lake or even just in your pool with um, a small group of friends. It's done publicly because it's a public expression. Um, and it's also a representation of what Christ did for us. So we go into the water as Christ died, and then we come up as he rose from the grave. Um, and so oftentimes we, you're going to have a million questions. Even today I still have these questions. Is this what the Lord has for me? And so when we check scripture, he doesn't always give us very specific examples in the Bible. Um, but when we compare that to um, what we know from God's word and the things that he continues to teach us, we are able to navigate those decisions. Yeah, and I think being our step to be baptized, like that's a, that's a next step in our transition um, from living, living a life that is dedicated to ourselves to one that's being fully surrendered to, to Jesus. And so that step, that's a step of obedience that, yeah, really, um, if, if you believe in Jesus and you are seeking to live an obedient life, we should do things that he, we're commanded to do. Um, Chris, and I think, I think this will tie in a little bit with the things that we, we ought to do or we know we ought to do, but sometimes we want to know why. Like, so why should we spend time volunteering at church? So, yeah, this does go hand in hand. So once Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life, it doesn't just end there. You have a job to do, and our job is to share the new life of Jesus with the world one person at a time. And so one way that we can share that is through serving. And when we serve, I'm going to change that word. Did you say volunteer? Yeah, so I'm going to change volunteer to serving because Jesus he served. That's how he showed love to people. He would have meals with people. He cared for people. He healed people. He would just, he served them however he could. He served, he led by serving. And that's what we should do as well. But when you serve on a team, you just become so much more aware of what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. I mean, you are working together on a team to accomplish something incredible. That's far beyond anything that we could accomplish on our own. And that's what God has called us to do. He wants us to work together as a community of, of believers to continue his mission. So whenever you see here like, hey, I want to serve on the tech team, or I want to serve on the worship team, or what's that, the snack shack, or somewhere, like you're part of a team. And when you do serve on a team, you get this like, backstage pass to how the church works and you appreciate it so much because you can see how much work it takes into pulling off a service into creating this incredible event for students to come to or for you guys to bring your friends to and so it's so important that we deny ourselves and take up that cross and that we sacrifice our own personal desires and wants to serve God and to serve others. Yeah, I'm going to take it a little step further and ask you guys, um, so this is, this is a question for all of you for sure, um, what made you desire to serve? Ooh, I got this one. <laughs> um, so, like, in general? So, yeah. when I first started serving at the church, I was 14 years old, so a lot of you are probably... Some, a good bit of you are probably around 14. Um, and so, when I was 14, I was... Um, at the church, and I loved kids all the time. I wanted to be with kids, and I was asked to serve in the kids' ministry. And so I started to do that, and I just grew a love for it. Um, and if my children's pastor hadn't asked me to do that, I would not be where I am today. Everything in my life would be drastically different if someone didn't see something in me and I didn't start serving on a team. I understood what it really meant to serve others and to tell people about Jesus, to tell children about Jesus, and it just like ignited this fire in me, and that's all I wanted to do. And it's so cool how God worked in my life because when I went to college, I didn't go to college to be in ministry. I went to college to be a teacher. Um, and, and God was like, nope, like, remember when you were 14 and Miss Linda said to you, like, I know you're going to be a children's pastor someday. And I was like, that's funny. And it happened. She saw something in me and God worked in me and I could see the beauty of serving and furthering his kingdom in that way. 
I did not grow up in the church. And when I was in high school, a group of adults um, were just around. They would come to my high school and they would show up at um, soccer games and chorus concerts. And um, they eventually built a relationship with me and they shared the gospel of Jesus with me. And I had this very profound experience. I was not this like bad kid. I wasn't into anything crazy. Um, but I realized that there was this hope outside of myself. And the more that I would read the Bible for really the first time ever, I realized that these adults, they were doing what Jesus did. They, they weren't, you know, like stodgy church people, right? They were actually living like Jesus did. They were hanging out with um, a bunch of crazy high school kids. And, um, and so I realized in that moment that my life could be like that that everywhere I go, I can tell people about Jesus, not like in a weird, awkward way, um, but by being kind to people. And so for me, it really is a service kind of in its entirety. At church, obviously, um, I serve in a variety of roles because they fit with my gifting or because I really love hanging out with middle school and high school students. Um, and so you kind of find those places, sometimes expectedly and sometimes unexpectedly. So I grew up in church, and I always knew that, you know, the, the things of the Bible. I knew who Jesus was. I knew that he died for me. But I had not given up my life to him at that point. Through my early 20s, I spent a lot of time straying away from these guardrails that we were just talking about. And uh, it's true, they're supposed to, you're, these rules are in place to keep you from hurting yourself and others. And that's what I did was caused a lot of damage to myself and other people around me. Um, when I finally got to the end of that, I gave my life up because there was n nothing else left. And through a period of time after that, I came back to church and gave up any control over my own life and decided that whatever I felt the Holy Spirit nudging me to do, I would do. Uh, one of them being a men's retreat that I went to where I met Kristen's husband, which has been a big part of my life. I also met Matt, and I believe you mentioned to me about youth group, and I didn't even know there was a youth group, yeah, so I, I completely blew it off. And then uh, he approached my wife Andrea, who's the eighth grade girls leader, and said, we want you to be a youth group leader and I'm coming for your husband next. <laughs> yeah. Very direct. Yeah, so I said yes before he even really asked me the second time. I'd forgotten about the first time. Yeah. Um, and I've been saying yes to that calling ever since, and that's why I'm up here tonight, um, which has been a great honor. I, I'm uh, really honored to serve you guys here. I used to spend my nights getting drunk and all kinds of other tomfoolery, and now I get to talk to you guys about Jesus. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you guys for sharing that. Um, something that um, I want you guys to be aware of, we, we, we celebrate our leaders uh, or try to regularly, but I'm going to ask our leaders to stand up now um, who, are, who are sitting out there uh, with you guys, um, just so that you, you can realize, like, they gave up their Tuesday night to invest in you. So yeah, let's celebrate them. I think that's really cool. They all made the choice to hang out with you guys tonight. Um, so make sure when you go to small group, uh, thank them. Um, maybe pick them up an extra donut um, or at least shake their hand. That would be wonderful. Um, we're talking about serving. We're talking about volunteering. I think this, I think this, goes, this, this next question fits right in there too. Um, so Kristen, uh, we're going we're to stay on you. We're just staying on you. We're hammering you with questions right now. Um, I'm, you are a pastor. So um, we're going to ask you a whole bunch of hard questions. Um, why do churches want my money? That was a question that came in. It's a fair question. It's a very good it's question. It's a fair question. Um, yeah. I don't know. Hopefully they weren't angry when they said it. Yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> I did read it like, I did read <laughs> like, it. Like, why do you want it? Um, but, yeah. Um, so, it's not your money. It's not your money. It's God's money. Everything 
that we have belongs to God. And when we realize that, it is so much easier for us to be able to give back to God what already belongs to him. Um, I want us to think for a moment. I like to like kind of paint a picture in your head. So I want you to think about like your favorite sports team. Now your favorite sports team, for, for them to be able to exist, they need to purchase uniforms, they need to rent out a facility or buy a building, or they need to have all the material and equipment that they need to be able to play their sports. They're going to have to travel to events, all of these different things. And that costs money. Churches are the same way. <laughs> when we have a building, we need to be able to pay the bills. We need to be able to put on events for you guys. We want to be able to pay the staff. We need to be able to do those things, and the only way that we can do that is through the generous tithes and offerings of the church family. Tithing can be a really difficult thing to do at first, and I'm going to share um, about my first tithing experience as an adult. Um, when Jake and I got married, we um, didn't really value tithing. We went to church, but not consistently. And we were kind of those people that like, oh, if we go to church, we'll throw a 20 in the offering basket. But you know what? We're going to a pretty big church. They had these like really fancy, like our children's ministry is awesome, but this children's ministry was like Disney World. And their stage was beautiful. They had these incredible stage designs. Their worship team was like literally like professional singers. I was like, what is happening? And so my mind went to they don't need my money. They don't need me. They don't need me to be giving them money because they're clearly doing a great job. And at that time, Jake and I were really struggling financially. We had just gotten married and we just were barely making ends meet and we couldn't even imagine giving 10% of our income. And so we were like, that's just crazy and this church doesn't need it. That is when God started really working on my heart because that was a lie from the enemy. That is a straight up lie. Because when we give, we are giving to the mission of Jesus. We are giving to the lost. We're, be able, we're able to provide resources. We're be able to provide people who are going to go into the world and reach lost people. Can we do it without money? Yes. We can reach people without any money. But it is much more for, it's easier in a sense to be able to have this safe building for you guys to come to, to have youth group. Whenever you guys do your overnight or we're able to do that because of the generous tithes and offerings of the church family who so graciously give of their time and their talent and their, all their energy, their intention um, to serving Jesus because they want to be part of what God is doing here on earth in the future of the church, which is you guys. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Oftentimes when we talk about tithing or giving, we say, well, later when I maybe make more money, I can do this, right? Or so maybe you um, work for your aunt and uncle and they give you $20 for cleaning out their basement or something, you know, and you're like, what's $2? But you're right, what is $2? The, the, the issue is really your heart and to say, it's $2 and I am going to give that to the Lord. And to add to, um, so when Jake and I made that commitment, we said like, hey, we looked at our budget and we were like, we are going to give at least 10% back to the church. We're going to do this. We're going to make the sacrifice. It was hard at first. It was hard. Um, and when we did it, I swear over the next two months, blessings just started overflowing. And we were like, okay, God, thanks. Like, we get it. We see why this is way more of a blessing to us to be able to give than to receive. And, like, things were just happening, and we were so amazed by how God worked in such a miraculous way when we were doubting him. We didn't, we didn't think he needed it, but he, he doesn't need it. But it was very helpful um, to our, for our relationship with God um, and to be able to give and help. Yeah, wow. That's, that's great. That's an incredible story, too. Uh -huh. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about serving. We're talking about what are, you know, uh, giving our gifts and our, our talents, our, our time, our treasure, our touch and our attention um, to God. And uh, I just saw this question come through, and I think it's, I think it's a really great one um, because it, can, it, it, it 
it fits right into this. What, and so anybody can, can answer this, take, take a stab at it. What do I do in life if I don't feel God's direction? What if God's not leading me or I don't feel like God's leading me anywhere? I mean, I think some of it is based on age. You know, if you're 14 and you're like, I don't know what to do next. Well, okay, so you're going to go to school soon. You know, just keep going through those things. Keep praying. But maybe if you're a little older and you're trying to navigate, like, big steps and big decisions, um, the first would be to pray, to ask God for some wisdom and guidance. Um, Ask your small group leader, you know, what are some gifts and skills that you see in me? What are some things that maybe I could pursue? Um, You know, often we, we expect that God's going to just like drop this really big thing right in our lap. And uh, that's not how he works. You know, we take a step and then he kind of gives us a little bit more information and we take another step and he gives us a little bit more information. And there are moments that God will just drop something right in front of your lap, but it doesn't happen all the time. And I think that's important to recognize because sometimes we expect God just to be like, hey, <laughs> like you would be like, God, just tell me exactly what to do. Tell me all the steps. I will do it. Just be very clear with me. And it's not always like that in life. And so it's important to recognize that um, God is in it in the small things too. And it's important to just be faithful. And, can, and Leslie's right. Just pray it through um, and Ask your small group leaders, ask your spiritual mentors, whoever that may be, what do they see in you? Because that's that's something, that's how I found my calling, was someone came up to me and said, I see this in you, and I I didn't see it in myself. And so it's important to seek out your spiritual mentors for some guidance and what to do next. Yeah, I think uh, much like Kristen, uh, my initial path in, in serving God was not through filling the role that I am right now. But it came through uh, three other people who I really respect coming and telling me that, uh, that they're getting, that I'm called to step into this position. Um, and it took me saying no um, for like a month. Uh, and then finally my wife saying that, no, I think you, I think you should, I think this is where you're supposed to be. Um, and then for three and a half years after accepting that, position and and filling the role to be like okay well maybe maybe this is actually actually true but what it takes and listen I'm not the hero here God's the hero here because he 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 would have been okay if I had said no he would have found somebody else to be here he would have found somebody else to serve you um he would have found somebody else to serve your leaders um God God doesn't need me he's asking me and he's going to ask you too but I think it does take finding some people um, like, your, like your small group leader, um, like your parents, who, who can look at you and say, you know, you are gifted here. Maybe you should look at this. Maybe, maybe you should pursue this avenue in life, always through the lens of, well, okay, how is this going to bring glory to God? Where's my mission field going to be? Because not all, you, don't, you, don't have to be, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a director to, to, to serve God. In fact, the vast majority of the people in this world who call upon Jesus as their Lord and Savior are not pastors. They're living, they're living lives serving in a way that's keeping the rest of the world running. And we just get the opportunity um, to pursue him in, in, in a much different way. And so really get to, get to know your leaders. Your leaders are here to serve you and to speak that truth into your life. Um, and a lot of them have the gifting of looking and saying, you know what, I, I think this is where God has gifted you. So have that conversation with your small group leader. I love that. That's great. Um, Can I, I'd mm-hmm. like to add that um, there was a time where I was looking to serve and, I, and do something more, and it felt like I was being told to do something more, but I didn't know what that was. And every time I prayed about it, it just kept coming back. He, he just kept saying to me, get ready. I didn't know what for, for what for. I just knew that it was get ready. Um, and I continued to make changes in my life that I needed to make. But if you don't know exactly what it is, start getting ready in some direction. Start reading your Bible, Bible studies. There are podcasts and YouTube videos and so much information. There's the, the story of the Bible can be boiled down to something very simple that a child could understand. 
And, but many men go to the grave as old men, not understanding the full story of the Bible because there's just so much to it. Every time you start peeling back a layer, there's another one underneath of it. Start learning what's in there now and start, start developing that relationship. And as you do that, whatever you're supposed to do will, will, will come up in the right time. Yeah. Leslie, we're talking about uh, we're talking about people serving within the church, um, and uh, we're we're here to serve all people and to serve those that God has placed in our lives. Um, a question that came in that that I think is pretty relevant is why do good people die early? That's a big one. Um, the first thing to remember is that we serve an eternal God, a God who is outside of time and space. And so um, our 100 years or 50 years or two years are um, a blink in the eye of eternity. And that's really hard to imagine because we only know this finite, real life, right? Um, But I think oftentimes the question that we're really asking in that is, why do I suffer because somebody died? Especially somebody who is young, maybe a friend or a parent, um, and it just doesn't make sense. And when we look at scripture, we see over and over again that suffering is part of life. And as hard as that is to understand and to navigate, there's also some freedom in recognizing that Um, that life is hard, that hard things happen. And that in the midst of that, knowing Jesus, we have this hope in life eternal with him, that um, our short and momentary lives, whether it's ours or someone that we love and care for, um, that there's eternity with him after it. Yeah, yeah. Um, We classify people as good we have to remember that there, there are no good people. Um, we, we've, all, we've all made a mistake. We've all been disobedient to God, which automatically removes us from good people. Um, but that doesn't remove the hurt that comes when those that we love, those that we care about, um, pass away earlier than we, we think they should. Yeah. Hmm. Um, we're a little bit over time, but I, wanna, I want us to finish on a little bit of a lighter note, because that was a heavy question. Um, so, so, and I know, I know John's itching to answer these, these two. We're going we're gonna to combine them, um, uh, because I, I think they're good. They're, they're curious. They're curious questions, and uh, um, we have a lot of questions about heaven. Um, but John, can you see people on earth when you're in heaven, and can you talk to people if you're on earth in heaven? So Matthew 18.10, Jesus says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that they're angels in heaven. Always see the face of my Father in heaven. And there's, there's other Bible verses that talk about Jesus interceding for us in prayer in heaven and um, even people praying to God for things that are happening on earth. So I want to say it's possible that people can see you know, the the. the People in heaven could see us on earth. There's nothing directly that says that in the Bible, but I don't see why it couldn't be possible. Um, And then, can you talk to people in heaven? So, I think if you're in heaven, of course you can talk to other people. That's the whole point of our church community and the 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 believers in heaven. It's it's a big community, and talking would be a crucial part of that. as far as talking to people in heaven from this side of heaven, that gets really complicated. There are, there's one story in the Bible where, uh, in the Old Testament, where a medium, a witch, calls upon a dead person and speaks to them. So apparently it's possible through some kind of demonic witchcraft that you could do something like this. But there's also the question of, can you just, you know, like, when I miss my grandfather, I talk to him. It's not to get a response. I'm not praying to him to get, you know, to, to ask him for something. It's just I talk to him like he's there um, because I miss him. So I think you can. It just depends on on the light in which you're you're, you're talking to them. Are you doing it through 
where you're trying to get a response or get something from them, I think that crosses the line into something that's wrong. If you do it just because you miss them, I don't think there's any harm in that. Yeah, we do need to, we do need to be careful while we're, we're doing it. This, the spiritual realm is very, very real, um, both for good, for life, and for death, for evil. Um, and so the, the story that, you, that you're referencing, um, it was with Saul, right? Um, who, who is using a witch um, to talk to a dead, a dead prophet. Um, that, that's demonic, and we want to make sure that we steer clear of that. That is very, very wrong. In fact, um, one, of the, one of the many laws that, that the Israelites, God's chosen people, were given um, in the Old Testament, it specifically said um, not, not to try to talk to the dead. Um, and that was, that's, a, that's a very specific law. Um, and Jesus came, and he came to bring us life and to talk about life. And um, what he did was he, he really came to abolish the law, but really he gave us one, one command that fulfilled all of the law, right? And so um, we need to be careful when we're asking those questions. That's a good question. We need to be careful. I think how John answered it was, was perfect. Right? Is it is it wrong when to 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 be to be talking, not expecting an answer, not praying to them, but talking to them? No, they're a part of our life. But if we're calling upon them for information or to get something out of them, um, first of all, that most likely is not them. It's probably a demonic power that we don't we don't even want to attempt. Um, so that was that was really that was really good. Yeah. Um, we have a lot, I saw a lot of questions that came in. We're going to, we're going to take some time to answer them um, away from right now. Um, but uh, I think we should thank our panelists. We're going we're gonna to call it a night up here. I think they did a wonderful job. Oh, we got one more thing. Wait, hold your applause. John needs to speak. Real quick. Because there is a lot of questions about heaven. Hmm. And the Bible, I think, is purposely... Um, doesn't say much about it on purpose because it's so amazing that there's no human words, no, there's no way to describe what we're, as Christians, as believers, going to experience there, um, and which can be said about hell as well, which is the absence of being in the presence of God. And as I dug into these questions, there's a lot that I don't understand, I don't think we're meant to understand. But there's two things that, I, that stood out to me that I wanted to share with you guys. There are other religions out there that have ideas about heaven where, you know, such as when you die, you're out of existence altogether. That's completely contrary to the Bible and to the truth, and that's not the case. There's other religions that um, promote suicide, and that also is really in the face of what God wants for us. Heaven is our reward for running a good good race here and, and, and having faith in Jesus. And we should not try to shortchange that in any way by getting there sooner than what we're supposed to. But if you have shame and guilt from these sins that, that everybody has, there's a way out of that here and now. And that's through Jesus' kingdom that is here and now. We are temples of the living God. We, we are given the Holy Spirit when we become Christians and that freedom and that freedom from sin makes it as if we are in heaven here and now, able to do the work of Jesus here and now, and we don't have to go there to experience those benefits. Life here still won't be perfect, but it's way better than the alternative. Um, so, Yeah, thanks. I'm glad we didn't go to small group. That was awesome. Um, but now we're going to go to small group. Um, so thank, you, thank your panelists one more time. Before we go, let's pray. We'll pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the truths that were spoken tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you um, that we do, when we call upon your name, Jesus, when we call upon you as our Lord and Savior, we do, um, we get the added benefit of going to heaven. heaven. Heaven is a side effect of following you. It's not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal should be and ought to be 
um, and is to, to live a life of obedience to you. Um, but we're so thankful that we have the hope of getting to spend the rest of our eternity with you in heaven. Lord, if there's anybody who is unsure about where, where they stand with you, I pray that they would ask their small group leader, that they would work up the courage to talk about that, to ask that question. Lord, for the questions that we didn't get answered, Lord, I, I pray that, that they come up inside of small group or, or that we're approached afterwards um, that we can answer, answer these questions that are, that are really, some of them really key to our belief in you and, and the promise that you have given us. I pray that there is comfort and there is uh, that that there's truth that is brought about in our lives because of that, and that for each of us, when we return to school or we return to our families or both, that uh, we have the courage to uh, talk to our friends, our teachers, uh, or talk to our family members about who you are and the promise that we have in you. It's in you who we praise. It's in you, your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen.